So to review, we've been talking about a planet-wide apocalyptic disaster, which was caused a great mud flood that then destroyed a worldwide empire that then went through a giant reset. I'm calling it STEM punk for like science, technology, algebra, engineering, mathematics. Um, it was not a renaissance, but a reset. History was hidden and erased in order to hide what had happened. The empire was rebranded to hide, and it wasn't rebuilt. It was here all along. Some of it was demolished, even. So let's get into the economy of Tartary, because what's sort of interesting is this idea that it was an international agreement across many nations, including American Indians, who, um, by the way, were confederacy. And when I say confederacy, you know, you kind of intuitively know that they had chiefdoms, but they were literally part of the confederacy, fought in the south and kept slaves themselves. So it's an interesting part that we'll get into. Um, so before we get too far in, I just want to talk about taking all of these ideas and tying them together. The first thing you're going to want to do is take all the ideas that you have and just put them away for a minute. It doesn't mean you have to forget them, but you're going to just want to put them in another place. And the best way to do that is to figure out what you know is been taught to you and then what you can perceive about it with your senses and replace your preconceptions with your senses. And then I want you to think about all of these things that you've heard and seen and felt and heard, tasted and smelled even and empathized with and been aware of the feeling. So part of the series will be looking at the difference between truth and hidden meaning. So you might wonder, what's the point of studying history? Because you know already that history is not true about the subject which it is lying. However, lies invariably are about truth. So we can study these lies and find the deeper meanings. So we're going to look at things like symbols and words, particularly ones that mean pejoratives or negatives that actually have positive connotations. Primitive is a great example. We're told that the people that lived long ago were primitive. But when we think about this word, primitive, primal, primordial, prime, comes out. And we know prime root really means prime radical. So it's more likely that they were quite civilized, actually, and that they're hiding something. So we're going to get into what sort of a society that they had constructed. Historically, a lot of social contract theory comes to the Magna Carta, although Cyrus's cylinder of Columbus Day 539 BC technically is perhaps more important. The important thing about that also is before Christ. Uh, I know we want to say common, but there's, there's a lot of reasons why we should talk about what that word really means. Christ and Messiah mean anointed one, which refer to the exodus oil made of cannabis that the Therapeutica used to anoint each other during the times of Gnostic Occidental mysticism. So it's interesting that they haven't changed the calendar. They've just sort of changed its name. I mean, go ahead, use another calendar. I did for a long time, switch to the Mayan long count. It's a great calendar. Just write it on your hand every day. But if we're going to use BCE and CE, I think we should describe it differently as before the collapse era and the communist era, which really makes a lot of sense to take the common era and to use iconoclasm to steal the work, change the names, <laughs> and present some sort of a false history. Anyway, so this idea that the Magna Carta was signed under duress by a tyrannical king who was unfair, an absolute monarch, foolish and considered ugly, and then the people were saved and their rights were restored to them. This is a false legacy. What really happened is nothing like this. And the reason we know that is because the story tells you about a king who was forced to sign a contract. An agreement must be voluntary. Any forced involuntary contract is essentially non-legally binding. There are um, exceptions to this rule, of course, but in general, the idea is to know what you have participantly signed a contract of and what the rules are. So let's look at this history slightly differently. King John Plantagenet, who 
yes, looks not so ugly. In fact, looks a lot like Christ was threatened upon signature with death if he did not sign. Which is sort of an interesting metaphor for our social contracts that we keep to this day. And it is an important thing to remember that efficiency of breach is used to this day. So every contract has a clause, including the Magna Carta. And every contract is based on some sort of uniform commercial code. You can make a contract of your own, but if you don't, it's often assumed that you're using the uniform commercial code. And in the Uniform Commercial Code, it is written that when you accept a benefit, you are obligated to accept the obligations and duties of that contract. For instance, if you eat a fruit in a store, you are expected to pay the price. And these are the agreements that we live for. It's part of relationships, which is a form of symbiosis. And there's many kinds of symbiosis, but essentially the concept is that the union gives strength. Um, there, there's not just positive or negative symbiosis. But in general, symbiosis makes it possible for many different things to work together to become a larger thing. Sort of like the Siphonospora, which is a jellyfish order, actually comprised of 188 species of jellyfish, which could not live independently, but together create an inseparable duo, the body politic. And the human is, in fact, a body politic as well. This is why we use this term. We are a sea of many species. And the union brings us together into a form of hierarchy and that complexity of specialization requires us to have a symbiosis so there are types of symbiosis communalism commensalism is a type of symbiosis where neither one is affected parasitic symbiosis is where one takes from the other and the other loses in the relationship and there are a lot of parasitic relationships around us. And the parasites produce offspring, which continue to create new relationships and to live off of the larger organism. Parasites that practice lecherous occult and the destruction of our society in order to benefit themselves to empower themselves and to take away what little we have because they do not produce enough for themselves. And while they may think that it often is beneficial or at least commensal, it's often not. It's often parasitic. So a great relationship would be an example, a non-parasitic relationship would be an example of the, the wolf and the raven. And it's a relationship that goes back in the arts thousands of years um, into the Indo-Aryan times, there was a relationship between the Vikings and the tribes of the Scythians, and they created a trading empire, which allowed for nomadic persons to meet and citizens to meet in cities. And this allowed for an expansive empire that had diversity of race and religion. So often when people on the internet now are worried about the past, they say, you know, Africa or Egypt or North America or Asia and sort of exclusively, but we know that we were all connected at one point and that there was some sort of symbiosis. So looking around the planet, there are the ruins of all of these great civilization. There's these temples everywhere and there are words and symbols which have been obscured but still leave remnants. For instance, Tartarian has the Tori and Aryan in the title. Also, in the analog, we're looking at words like territory, tariff, trade, barter, tartan. I'm just using your, your, your vocabulary, you can find a lot of words that are rooted in Tartary. And Sanskrit is a great clue for this, because of all the Indo-Aryan languages that are rooted in Sanskrit, we'll find that Hindu languages like Hindi and Germanic languages like German itself have very similar words and terms and alphabets. For instance, in Sanskrit, Mama Nama means my name is, where my Namen is, you know, my name in German. So it spread very clearly. And then you can see the differences in pronunciations. For instance, in Spanish, do you like bands? If you like the shoes, the vans, I remember hearing, because B and V and D and T can often be um, exchanged. 
And spelling does matter in ways, because you'd rather be on a desert island with dessert. It also affects the way people speak depending on where they're from. This is how we know about the lisp of the Catalan accent in Barcelona, Spain, because the royal family. But it's not that confusing to see how they were able to spread this language so far. When you look at the planet from a northern projection of the pole, you can see how close these places really are to each other, especially with boats. So carrying this culture across North America, Eurasia, would have been a, a fast path. And we can see the records of Phoenician letters and Etruscan letters and the Roman, and we see how they came even from Sumerian, from the Tartary. So Kemet, which is one of our oldest records of African culture, it shows this as well. And while it is very clearly a African empire, worships, like the rest of the empires, something greater than themselves. So I'm not going to say it's, you know, extraterrestrial, but there is some sort of sacred geometry that's worth noting. And I think that is a good subject on itself that is worth looking into. I recommend videos by Scott Onstott on the subject. Probably the best word to describe Secrets in Plain Sight, his series on the sacred geometry of reality. The word is defin definitive. It's just nothing I've found more. I would say you should buy his books. They're fantastic. I'm highly recommending his series. So the history of the symbols of the Tartarian Empire are built into its structure. There were star forts across the land and sea. There were players in this game that was an economy. And there was a banker system that brought things back and forth in a self-propelled civilization, which saw technology as worship. And this explains why they worshiped the propeller so much. And I know this is kind of scary subject for some people, and, but really, it's even if it's been forbidden because you think it's a symbol of hate, please remember that all talismans have whatever meanings you project on them. Context is everything, and it's a really bad idea to put negative energy into a symbol. I mean, that's just a tip that I would recommend. And in general, if you're going to give up the propeller, you might as well give up carrots and spinach and animal rights, um, too, because they're all inextricably linked by identity politics, if you really feel that way. And a better thing to do would probably be to dismantle the hate and find the true root of these symbols. Of course, that's totally up to you if you want to give up propellers and vegetables. But an example of some people that do love the propeller and are not evil, as far as I can tell, are the Jains, um, who are a pacifist Hindu cult that goes back many, many millennia. It's a religion that does not harm, it won't even harm a tuber, won't kill potatoes, won't eat roots from under the earth, will ex 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 specifically explicitly choose to eat vegetables, blossoms, and not kill the vegetables themselves. It's, it's such an interesting religion, and definitely not one that is associated with hate or murder or supremacy, unless it's the supreme divine individual spirit. But this also shows us that there's this great colorful culture that spanned the world, and that it believed in this self-generating living fractal system, and that these symbols were lucky, and that they were powerful, and not just powerful in an esoteric or an engineering sense, but that those two were essentially the same thing. And so it makes all of a sudden so much sense why these two symbols are so inextricably linked, the star for it and the propeller swastika, because without them, they could not get from one to the other, and they could not defend the other with the other. But we're told that these are evil because they're old, and we've gone through an era of iconoclasm, destroying maps, destroying symbols, taking and replacing, often rebranding when possible. A great example, of course, is the symbol of fasces, which is a number of rods bundled together with an axe head at the top. And what is an axe head, right? It's a tool, very clearly a tool. It's not, it's not a weapon. It could be a weapon, you know, but it's not. It, it, it's a tool that could be used to defend, but it's mainly a beautiful, elegant tool that can be used to craft 
to build houses, to make fires, to defend, but mainly it's a tool. So it's an interesting symbol that they use to represent fasces. As a, as a number of fragile reeds that are together stronger when attached. And it's destroyed everywhere we go. They tear it down. They don't want you to see it. And it's not just ISIS that's destroying these icons. And it's not just in Europe or in Asia. Across the world, we're destroying everything we have of the past, whether it was about something good or not. It's being justified as if it's for this better future. So a people that have a lot of imagery that somehow has survived are the Slavs. And it's not the same as the Soviets that you have seen so much of. The Soviet Union architecture is very specific, but in old country, there was a lot of, a lot of beautiful structures. There was essentially the fairy tale folk cottage style that we think of from art books, but real. And these are some examples mainly of the inexpensive cottages, these wooden houses and cottages and churches that survived or were somehow, you know, documented. But these are just the inexpensive uh, comparably to the large castles that existed. And we'll see peacock feathers and notice tattoos of sacred geometrical patterns and see that the Slavonic people were a great and cultured people, colorful, diverse, and part of the Tartarian Empire, along with the Scythians. The Scythians are a people that are remembered through the scythe today, which was their tool for harvesting. It's also considered um, the root for the Sith, which is an interesting connection to the Bene Jesuits from Dune that Star Wars had manipulated into um, sort of a Disneyfied version. They're connected to the Aryans, the Aryans who had boats and long houses. Now I know when you say Aryans, but really, yeah, it's okay to be Aryan. The Aryan, Indo-Aryans are a group that uh, they rose out of Mesopotamia and eventually went around the, the world and they're known for their boats, which they have in Eritrea and they have in the Viking world. But is it not unlikely that they were just part of this greater empire that we now know existed in the same places that they traveled? And we see the, the examples of tribes which look like mixed between Scandinavians and Scythians or Asians. And it starts to make sense why there are so many diverse races in the last 500 to 1,000 years because of traveling by sea, even though the origin myth really described there being many less races, in fact. And so looking at the longhouses of the Pacific West Coast of the North Americans, we can see that there is some truth to the official history that this Leif Erikson character had come from Scandinavia through Greenland to Vinland and discovered the new world at some point making arrangements for trade with the Scythians and that they stayed and created um, a cultural exchange that has lasted and you might say that it could just be intuitively logic that they look the same but I think the more you look at it the more you see the specific specificity of their design is from this Malaysian, Indo-Aryan, American um, trade. And so you could, you, we have reasons to believe that it's not just a uh, land-locked continent like Godwana or Pangea or an ice bridge, but actually boats in interaction. But any of these solutions will describe why we have these noble savages, as they were called, who were cultured, civilized, and also in some cases, clearly more Asiatic or more Scandinavian than others, including the Han tribe of, of Canada. So the Han, the Asian, the Chinese, when we talk about, let's talk about the Chinese first, because those are all different things. And before we get into the Chinese, let's talk about origin models for nations. So I use the trapezoid scheme. And the way I look at it is usually a foreign king invades, not with his own sons, but often with conscripted soldiers from another defeated nation. 
and they are then forced to defeat the enemies of the king, which exhaust the defeated empire and continually exhaust the undefeated empire into defeat. When the nation is defeated, they're conscripted, they're enslaved, they're culturally erased, and they are assimilated into a working class or a, or a soldier class, like the formerly defeated that helped defeat for the king, the new nation. And this perpetuates colonialism and also the culture through a system called curiarchy. And curiarchy is a system of cross-sectional polarizations that are used to isolate and to antagonize different groups of people into submission to a larger system. So you might consider yourself male or female, but you might be black or white, or you might be Republican or liberal. And each one of these cross sections puts you in a smaller and smaller um, group where you have less and less advocates from the rest of the identity politic. So using the system, it puts the upper class at the top and the slave class at the bottom and gives a certain amount of leeway to the middle class so long as they encourage the lower class to behave and are discouraged by the lower class from being from disbehaving misbehaving and this also translates to an essentiality for concern because your capacity con for concern is dependent on your ability to um, take care of your fundamental physiological needs your safety your love and self-esteem before you can reach self-actualization. So it essentially licenses self-actualization for the elite and takes it away as an option for the poorer classes. And it's a repeatable experiment. You can see this all over the world in India with the caste system, in the serfs of Europe, which had a religion at the top, incidentally similar to the Brahmin priesthood above the princes, and in Latin American society as well. And Another interesting thing about this model is it shows that the foreign king is at the top and the conscripted soldiers are in the middle and the defeated nation is always, always, always at the bottom. And so looking at the Latin Americans, of course, you have the peninsulars at the top and their mixed race slightly underneath them. The Africans who have been brought in to slave are above the indigenous. And that's not the only place you're going to find that. You look into India the Indo-Aryans at the top are not the natives, the untouchables are. And there's plenty of statistical evidence to show and etymological and linguistic evidence to show that this is the case. And, you know, ask a Tamil. But looking into Europe, it's very, very similar. It's not that <laughs> Europe was ever really run by Europeans, as far as we can tell. Um, I mean, England was a Roman Britannic state for a very long time, full of slaves. And it, was, it is to this day run by the Wilhelm uh, House of Windsor, which is you know their, American, their British English version of their name, Wilhelm. But they're not hiding it very well. I mean, King George III couldn't speak English during the American Revolution, which I'm sure made it easier for the Masons to manipulate independence and anti-disestablishmentarianism. But he wasn't the first king either. It's not that the German line is the first. I mean, William the Conqueror, a Norman, could not speak English either. For 300 years, his line did not. So this, this is where we get back into who is China. Because if England is in English and South America is in South American, and India isn't run by the Indians, I doubt China is either. And there's 56 ethnic minorities that are listed, just listed, not counting the ones that are completely eradicated or in the process of being so. And they're fascinating, interesting people with great cultures. The, for instance, the Hmong people, who have some of the most fantastic magic um, that's still practicable to this day. And very, very much notice the peacock on her shirt as well, because the peacock you will find again and again. The Yi people, fantastically different designed clothes. And yeah, sure, she looks Chinese. She looks Chinese. The sake people look pretty Chinese in this picture, but do their clothes. And that's a good example of the hidden culture. The Tibetans. There are remnants of conquered peoples in these Chinese. You've seen them become Chinified, but you've not seen them become Chinese. Ethnic cleansing does not fully work. And I know this is a subject that China is trying to say is at very least not to be talked about, whether or not it's true. 
But I would say that whether or not it's impolite, the evidence is honorable, that their homes have been occupied and their culture has been erased. And I think it's also important to watch the film Hero, if you ever have the chance, which is a Jet Li film, a propaganda film from China that was released in the United States by Quentin Tarantino. And essentially it tells the story of the Chinese um, occupying the Chinese lands and then Oh, I should go back to that. I'm sorry. I'll go back to this point. But basically, in China, there was a reign of arrows and a burning of all the books and the destruction of all the culture. And the question is, is asked, if all of history was erased and only one single symbol from your culture could be saved, which symbol would you save? And this is, this is like, you know, these are the sad feels I get. Like, honestly, I can't help but feel for iconoclasm that's something that really gets me i think about the hidden christians of japan that were unable to admit what they believed for hundreds of years under threat of being crucified upside down so we'll get back into that let me go a little bit further back though because i skipped forward to talk about that movie so how do you murder a mandala and here's an example of a suppressed culture in china is tibet and tibet is um well known for being civilized and occultic, esoteric. Um, they make fantastic mandalas out of sand paint and then wipe them away. So it seems kind of like the hardest culture to really erase and the one that gives so much hope because sure, they can rape and murder and they can move in a bunch of Chinese to Tibet. Um, but no matter how hard they try to conquer Tibet and to make Tibet China. China will never, never be Tibet. It can never be Tibet. Tibet is just too fantastical. It's too magical. It's too sophisticated. And I don't mean to take those words and say that they are exclusive to Tibet, as China has a fantastical, magical culture of its own. But it isn't, it is separate and it is different. So there's also the connections between Tibet and Egypt, which are, you know, the Book of the Dead. It's not the only Book of the Dead. And the, the beliefs in chaos and order and Saturn and the moon, there's enough evidence to show a West Coast connection between the same Shintoism of Japan and the Book of the Dead of Tibet and the Book of the Be Dead of Egypt and the Book of the Dead and the Day of the Dead in Mexico. So, the next thing we were talking about, the hidden Christians of Japan, where Japan had believed Jesus had actually been, then there was a giant war, which ended up in the destruction of the Japanese Christians and the hiding of the Christians. The old ways are remembered. Anyway, these are allegedly the real Chinese. But I have to ask, if a rape culture is the product of rape, is rape culture really your culture? So here's a non-Han Chinese origin story. There's another China. And it's worth knowing that China. So in Xin's land, these are the Chinese conquering invaders. This is the Great Wall to keep out China. These are the Han that got into the wall. Officially, they're supposed to be Chinese, but I would say the Uyghurs are not just another ethnic group. They're supposedly Turkish looking, but this is because the last of them that are allowed to be considered their own people live in Turkey. Still, these people live in China to this day, and they are Chinese. And it makes you think about indigenous people and their cultures being taken from them and their lands being taken from them and their assimilization through rape. And the Chinification, this is a conscripted soldier and this is the outcome. And it's repeated again throughout history. Here's a example of a Mongolian now 
dressed as a Soviet soldier right before the greatest tragedy of World War II, arguably, was the Lost Women of 1945, where so many women and children between the ages of 13 and 80 were raped. An entire race created. And it's something that we're told we know happened, but somehow we're supposed to be justifying it because the Germans did bad things during the war too, or at least their husbands did. So, you know, the men were bad, so we should rape their women and their children. Although I'll ask you to find some evidence that's neither cartoon nor Hollywood, because I think a mob will probably have a hard time doing that. It's a lot easier to be vindictive than to think about the qualities of a situation, but I have to ask, was this really the right way to do it? Because if you're not being fair, you'll end up having to pay the bill later. So these are the conscripted soldiers. Where were they from? Well, the Koreans are called the Han, and this makes a bit of sense because the Koreans are a people, a very great people, a very magical people, a very rich culture that worship the moon and the portal and have been divided, oppressed, yet have been always unified regardless of this effort that's been put upon them. And they worship the two pillars, they have the sun and the moon dynamics, and while they are proudly not Chinese, they maintain very many Chinese artifacts in their culture. So is it possible that these are Korean artifacts and they are not Chinese in origin? We consider many Japanese things to be Chinese in origin. Could it be that these Chinese things are Korean? Another movie to watch that's interesting, from Korea, 2009, Lost Memories, which is an alternative timeline that shows what would happen if the Japanese had never lost their control of Korea in World War II. And it's definitely an interesting story. But it could very well be that there's an effort just to confuse us about history, and that Marco Polo was right all along, and that, in fact, Chinese were not Chinese, but Persian before the Han, before the building of the wall in the Great War in the 1600s. So Marco Polo, who was from Cruiser Croatia, which is a giant white stone cast castle island in the middle of the Balkans, he was known for traveling to China. And he arrived back in Europe and was imprisoned right before the beginning of a great European war. And his stories were dictated in prison about his travels through the Tartary and into China, where he eventually met Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan is, until recently, not depicted as a Chinaman. He's never a Han. He's always a redhead. And in the old days, we used to think it was kind of strange that they would put John Wayne as Genghis Khan, but now I have to think it's just part of the tradition. And Marco Polo probably wasn't wrong about that. There's so many things we were told Marco Polo was correct about, but we're supposed to believe these things that were incorrect were just such huge misconceptions that we would miss them? It seems unlikely. It's more likely that we're wrong about so many things in history because we saw the Netflix version. However, you know, it's possible that so many of these races have been changed in order to um, obscure the importance of them and to show that the Caucasian is some sort of a, you know, elite singular race, but I, I kind of think not. I think it makes more sense that there's just a grand economy that shares in the spoils with all of the nations. However, China from Persia, Persians from China, the Parthian era, the redhead Iranian Persian Chinese. There's a lot of evidence to show that. Before we get any deeper into history, I would like to address oppositional pathology and the esoteric sciences, because a lot of what we're talking about is what we see. And the thing about what we see often is how we see it defines what it is. And this a lot of the time 
comes around the esoteric concepts of archetypes and um, Carl Jung and Man and His Symbols, which was a book that Carl Jung wrote that basically describes the idea that without God to illuminate our symbols, man is in darkness. And with those symbols, we are able to reflect upon ourselves. It's actually the Sanskrit word guru means to come out of darkness into light. And generally we have this concept of experts and the word experts comes from experimenters who have navigated the path and have found their way out of the labyrinth or at least have led us to the end results that they have found, which are the walls, the brick walls that they've not been able to escape. But if you look closer yourself and experiment, sometimes there are ways out of these walls and these brick walls are actually just doors and the keys to the buried treasure that are being guarded actually help us escape this system that we've been entrapped in for so long. It's because perspective and hubris is our perception and it's a lens that we can share. And it usually starts like this. In the beginning, there's lots of bright, interesting energy and we break it down. Patterns start to emerge. Often and usually we are taught which identities of patterns to notice from people that we trust. And when we start to see them open up, logos begin to form at what we call the delta point. And when the logos enter the psyche, then they became relationships in our, our youth. And we call this point the developmental psychology. Like psychology is just the measurement of the symbols and the metrics in our minds and their use. In school, we're supposed to trust our leaders and our educators to teach us how to think and what behaviors are acceptable. And we're supposed to know that they're reliable sources. But if it turns out they're not, then we're supposed to rely on our own experiments in order that we don't become skewed and lose all credibility and faith in something greater than the heretics who've misrepresented and betrayed us and the subject itself that they have lied about. So we'll talk about chemistry later, but I want to introduce this quote from Yale chemist professor Michael McBride. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts, right? And again, experts are experimenters. So science is more than just existential allegory. It's experimentation. Very, very much so. It's important that you be able to test something yourself. And at a point when people tell you that they are so well versed in experimentation that you don't need to or that you can't experiment and try these experiments and become an expertise yourself, that might be for lack of a better conspiracy just because of conformational bias is what I call it because they want you to confirm and then conform both yourself and others to an agenda shifting pattern. And this is what scientists are taught to believe from a very early age is acceptable because they know once they reach the point of no return that beyond the Socratic method of deductions that can be made through perceptions and that there's only a range of consistent predictability. And beyond that range is the philosophy of empiricism and empirical observations, which is essentially a cult of perception. And while observances can be made, they can be augmented and are not trustworthy. So science falls into a philosophy of trust and illusions and a distrust in your own observations, which scientists have already been well informed that there are many ways to see things and that right and wrong are merely points of view and truth ranges between the pillars of falsity. So it's more important to see the bigger picture and skeptics emerge and might say in some predictable responses to scientists' predictable responses, I have seen or I have read or I have experimented or at least my parents got me for Christmas that book on how things work. And the greatest threat to this conspiracy 
is someone getting their child a crystal radio kit and then putting it together and learning how things work and then saying that they can see right through it, that they see a system. And in that system, they find that there is a code and it's been encoded. And this is actually where we get the word encoded or coding or coders or programmers because of tapestries, which were encoded with programs by code weavers, such as Penelope. So another way of looking at things is to say that these are some sort of intellectual fights that are happening for the sake of teaching us how we're supposed to view um, another perspective. And it's true that we can learn and wrestle with each other's perspectives or you can be forced to see things a certain way. But if at some point someone tells you to see things that you have not been taught to see, or rather you've been taught not to see, it might seem less believable or hard to handle the truth beyond that range of acceptable belief and perception. This is where we get into this field of gestalt psychology. And gestalt is the German word which represents form or shape and perspective of that shape because there are many ways to look at many shapes and they're not all wrong. Some of them might not be better than others, but some might be better than others depending on your values and your needs. So it is everyone's prerogative to try to see things their own way at least to be able to see them differently and to find the way that is best to see them. And it's often we avoid that perception because we want to keep this rigid paradigm that is safe. But is it really? And where do we get it, right? It's usually something that starts the same way. We, we, are, we are to distrust ourselves. We are to believe we are worth less than ourselves. We are then to trust in these others who are, we believe, better than us and know more than us because they've gone further in the labyrinth than we have, so we must trust them. So we make an arrangement and an agreement and imprinting begins and some sort of perception or perspective or philosophy is imprinted into you forever and it's hard to remove and it defines and shapes your pathology and your cognition forever and it leads to what I call hypnotic reactionaries where sort of like after MK Ultra, where Nazi scientists had pioneered mind control and granted it was an end game of mind control but what was it really it was the study of oppositional defiance it then led to the ability to control the minds through mass hypnosis, which open sesame in the young times of the 60s <laughs> led to an entire society that believed that they had somehow created or discovered a truth that was their own. And Ginsburg had told them that the electric Kool-Aid acid test and their bus was just a CIA catch and tag and release program while he wasn't believed eventually the freedom of information act did prove that that was the case so there are many examples of important philosophers that wrestled with these subjects using their own senses however they did start with education Ram Dass of course very uh, Ivy League so it can be questioned were these found or were they revealed also um, I felt it important to mention the Grateful Dead. So many people seem to love the Grateful Dead, who used to be called the Warlocks, um, but they are part of the um, information campaign led by the American CIA in the 60s. So if you were to not follow your programming, if someone were to tell you that you had been part of MK Ultra or some related information, you are, were supposed to go insane, go rogue, and a self-destruct sequence would initiate. And there have been examples of agents going rogue and suiciding through bulletproof glass, which should be impossible, but shows what is possible with the mind. 
Um, and there's a lot of hypnotic reactionaries to this day. You see them every day, everywhere you go because of the media. And they respond on a level to vibrations and waves that are, they pre, they, 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 they precede the understanding of what it is they're upset about. They're simply upset at a level that is hormonal and perhaps radio. But this kind of training creates an entire class of non-playing characters who believe that they are the most diverse. And perhaps this is a perfect word, diversity, because it is the duoverse, the two, unanimity minus one. And if you take any meta, the quickest way to divide it, or the easiest way, is into two. Before you divide it into any more, you would divide it into two. There's this, this concept of I and thou, which was part of Martin Buber's philosophy, of binary meta philosophy, of unanimity minus one. It is very diametric, very binary, very digital, very oppositional um, and supportive at the same time. But it is not analog. It is not spectral. It is is you is, is you ain't. So how many senses do you have? You might think six senses, right, or five senses. But if you start to think about it, smelling and uh, tasting and feeling, well, th even eardrums and eye photonics are all sort of touch-based senses. And if you really think about that you have one sense, that you're sort of this seam amoeba that is describing different ways of feeling, remember that electrostatic means that you really can't touch anything, and you probably are making it all up. So you have no sense at all, but we may share one sense, and it's the concept of empathy. The sixth sense, awareness of how others feel, or how other, um, an understanding of how others and what others feel. And if you focus on that spiritual sense, you can discover and tune your other senses to better describe a more consistent, predictable reality. Last time we were talking about Marco Polo and his trip across Tartarian Europe, Asia, into the Chinese Empire of Persians, which was Indo-Aryan, and the indigenous Berger people, whom had been displaced by the Han, whom come from the lands of Korea. And so let's get into what Marco Polo said about China. Um, at the time, China was considered a Persian empire that was controlled by Genghis Khan. It was referred to as Katay or Kataya or Katayo. Um, Xin is the name of the emperor, which we derive the name China. At the time, the empires that surrounded Persia were the Ukrainian Cossack Empire, the Poles, the Byzantine Empire, the Bulgarians, Below Persians, there were the Mesopotamians, but in the center is an empire that is essentially remembered only through being conquered uh, by the name of Khazaria. And Khazaria was a noble class um, of grand viziers, often were in, involved in the trading and the intellect um, of the other cities, including. This is perhaps where Byzantine got its name. But the Battle of Kiev, which is detailed in the story of Taurus Bulba, um, is about the Cossacks, whom Taurus Bulba is the chief of, and the Polacks, <laughs> whom the Poles at the time were in cooperation to defeat the Ottoman Turks. So they had a pejorative, it's believed, that the Cossacks were called Tartarians and then called Cossacks when they were no longer Tartarians as long as they were working with the empire. Um, they were considered the saviors of the city of Kiev, which is 
in the modern day Ukraine, which gets its name from Ukrainian, which means the skull. Um, now, according to legend and in the movie, which is worth watching, I recommend. There's actually two. There's the American version and the Russian version. The American is a very fantastical 60s version. I'm surprised it could have ever gotten made, considering the subject matter. And the Russian version is essentially the modern uh, Braveheart of 21st century Russia. So Taurus Bulba tells the tale of two brothers who are raised uh, outside of the care of their father after he is betrayed um, by the Poles and their land is taken from them. So he vows that they will deceive the Poles by educating their sons in Polish schools. And <laughs> eventually they will overthrow the Poles and they will return the cities to their own people and the Cossacks will save again Kiev, um, this time from the Poles. And it's perhaps interesting that Kiev is so close to Kazaria and that this is the area where the Cossacks would have been invading from, um, according to this legend. Um, because the Cossacks, who um, are considered to be the pogroms uh, of the, the Russians who destroyed and caused the uh, great emigration into New York of the um, Jewish people of New York and of Canada, um, are also from the same place. And there is a uh, correlation etymologically between Khazarian languages, and there is genetic evidence that the Khazarians are the modern Ashkenazi Jewish people. And in fact, it is difficult to find a Sephardic gen genome um, in the Ashkenazi. In other words, it is difficult to say that the Ashkenazi are from Palestine, but are definitively from modern day Georgia, which is where Khazaria was. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a currently Georgia, near Russia. So, the other interesting etymological link is the Finns. Um, <laughs> and the Finns have their flag, which is the Air Force flag, um, with the Shvazi on it, the propeller, which um, it's very interesting that the propeller on wings is so Sumerian um, looking. And if you were to just put your thumb over the center of the symbol so that you can't see um, the uh, objectionable content, it would seem um, very, very, uh, very Mesopotamian. However, this symbol is, of course, older than uh, the 20th century German revolutions and National Socialism, and so the flag is continually waved to this day. Um, so, an interesting side note about the Khazarian correlation. Also, the Finnish people, um, their language is not Indo-Aryan. It is not connected to Sanskrit. It has 24 cases, which uh, alludes to a derivative culture of many castes and a high formality for interaction between aristocracy and um, merchant classes and different sorts of people and, and workers. So, but these symbols have existed for a long time and we inherited these fallen stars. And the thing about these symbols is they're not meant to be understood often by the layman. And so they can go on for a long time and have new meaning that has been ascribed to them. An example is the post office symbol of the United States, which used to be, before it was an eagle, the symbol of Mercury riding upon the Earth disk of America and handing off a message. Um, another is the Jolly Roger skull. Um, skull uh, comes from the Hebrew word for the skull that blossoms, uh, skull, which means rose, as a skull blossoms from the womb. Um, it is also called the Jolie Rouge, and it was a flag that was used not by, well, sometimes perhaps by pirates. Pirates didn't have their own flags. They would take other people's flags, right? But it would make sense for a pirate to take a banking flag like this because they would want to look like a banking ship. And since the Jolly Rouge was used pretty much by the Knights Templar and the banking ships to show that they were an armed ship, and we call it the Jolly Roger because of the French translation, the Jolie Rouge, which is because it was a red flag used by the Knights. So let's start by looking at a book 
a story called How the Irish Saved Civilization, the untold story of Ireland's heroic role from the fall of the Rome to the rise of medieval Europe. And essentially, it explains that when the fall of the Byzantine Empire, or the Eastern Roman Empire, because of the Justinian plague, or whatever atrocities went down, um, because there has been a number of plagues, and there are records of the 15th century and the 5th century plagues, which leads back to our calendar conversion that we'll talk about later. Um, also, the name Byzantine and Vizier and Byzantium um, are all correlated, which we'll get into later with the etymology of Tartarian words when we get into etymologies. So we're told that these rowboats, after the fall of the Byzantine Empire, brought all sorts of empire uh, property to the west of Europe, where traders and merchants from specifically Ireland, the porters, were able to sell and trade this iconography, and the markets were filled with books from the Byzantine Empire and Rome, which were valued and were collected, and this led to the Renaissance and a rebirth of civilization because of astute learners who were surrounded in information. And this makes a certain amount of sense. We know that the keepers of information um, are educated, right? And they're better than other people, of course, because they, you know, they learn things. And that's what it is that makes them so much better. Not. Anyway, so this is the crest of Carl Jung. And this is his family crest, which inspired him as a young boy to study symbols because he wanted to know what the inherent value of these inherited symbols was that he had been given and apparently had been correlated with a kingdom and with um, fantastical legacy of war. And, you know, there's a library and a castle. So you want to understand the background. But he ended up creating this which was his own uh, Carl Jung crest. And you'll see that it retracts the four-cornered uh, um, flag into a three-layered flag where there's a line of heaven in between um, the land. And the land is divided into um, the four corners and that which grows um, downwards and upwards, you know, as above, so below, which you know feeds off the sun and the earth, which is the perfect link of the Taurus. And above the head, of the helmet is an angel holding grapes, which is then above lightning rods at the base of the name Carl Jung. So this gets into the idea of talismans and their magical power and why people use medallions um, and why they're so correlated and why these symbols are the same so many places. For instance, the red shield of the Rothschilds, which you'll see it has the Tartarian um, double-headed, Austro-Hungarian, Byzantine, Scottish Rite, double-headed eagle, um, or phoenix, holding in its hand the wand or scepter and the ornament that represents this uh, metaphysical realm where you have uh, a hollow sphere that is at a water level and in the center is a magnetic cross. So... Uh, further into the coat of arms, the Rothschilds, similarly, their, their more complex coat, which represents the five suns, has the four shields of the four corners of Europe with a red shield in the center of it, representative of supposedly a very ancient shield in the center of the shield. However, what's strange about this shield is it's often represented as having horns, and then the centric uh, disc shield looks very much like a uh, money funnel to me. Uh, if you've ever seen a coin orbiter, <laughs> you can put a coin in and it comes out the center of a vortice. And um, if you know about fluid dynamics, what goes down also sends energy back up out. Um, so it's it's like a tornado. And so also, um, before we get deeper into why symbols are the way they are, um, let's look at the handheld uh, arrows on both corners. So we have, to, it's a dragon and a phoenix, and then there's a griffin and a unicorn on either side. Um, and the griffin and the unicorn, uh, I would suppose, would be the most 
um, fantastical creatures uh, representing Tartaria. And these hands are holding the arrows. And often we remember in the symbol of the empire that it was a bundle of arrows held together by themselves with string and making themselves into a tool. And it should probably cover woven braids, which are intricate, valuable tools that intertwine um, and interlock and uh, save. And the Boy Scouts are not the only ones to use these. They're interestingly passed down by women very often. However, they're a legacy and a skill that are very useful and to this day are often referred to as Turk ish head knots, but I think we can say Tartarian head knots in 2019. So braiding a single rope, um, very important. Very, very Braiding is a very important skill. Here they're being held and they're weapons. They're pointed. They're very clearly um, for weapons, but they're pointed um, one down and one at the other coming down. And the other one is not able to uh, lift it up in time to defend itself. And there are five arrows in the hand and this represents the uh, capital as well as the nations and uh, the kingdoms that are controlled. For instance, the dollar shows the American Eagle holding 13 arrows. So shields have um, important meanings, crests have important meanings, and it goes back very far to the power of a witch named Medea. And Medea is also where we get the word media medicine, Mediterranean, medallions. There there are many more, actually, that you'll probably think of that I'm not mentioning right now. But Medea was a witch, and she was maybe more of a esoteric occult scientist. And this gets back into the idea of um, the Chinese, which symbol would they save? Because they would make talismans by taking letters, removing the vowels, and turning the consonants into one symbol forward and backward, and you get a message that is hard to deconstruct, but you know what it means, and I call it encryption. It's sort of like a, a cryptology mixed into hieroglyphic symbols because you don't necessarily have a full phoneme anymore, but there is representation of the consonants, which is sort of this inherent um, logic. If you think about the kiki and boba, sometimes straight lines and uh, points like this arrow are thought of almost universally to represent kiki when they're asked which one is kiki and boba and curves are representative of boba so there is some sort of a logic to what sounds represent which symbols in fact that's why g and c um, come from right angles in sumerian and then sumerian of course we'll get into later the phonemes of tartaria because the sumerian alphabet's actually newer than tartarian and we have evidence of this it's not um, none of this is like without Citation. There will be citation for all of these um, accusations and claims being made. However, in the meantime, let's look at the idea of the sigil and the crest and the talisman and why it was important to these people that were hiding these um, meanings from other people because they did not want everyone to understand them. And so they would set them up in a way that kept them safe to be seen in public and misunderstood. And so it's a form of magic. Uh, and a lot of people understand magic. And not everybody likes what they see. Although, <laughs> I like I like, I like, like the POTUS in this picture because he clearly knows what's going on and he's not too worried about it. But the people on either side of him are because they can tell he's rocking boats. Um, but there is, there is power and symbolism that is not related necessarily to the observer. The audience might think that it's a mainstream Christian symbol, but the Vesca Pisces with the red cross coming out is Maitreya, or I'm sorry, for now I'll call him the Christ, but these represent an entirely older religion than what we've been told that they represent. The Vesca Pisces actually represents the two pillars coming together to create a portal. Between the two pillars are um, the, the a sight of God. Um, there is, a, there is a, sta a stage, a stage that is um, set up for worship with an altar. And the top of the pillars are just below God and or the architect. <laughs> and so on the other side, you can see that there are on top of the pillars um, spheres that are representative of the earth and of the stars. It's the 
Um, but it's the interior and the exterior. One is supposed to be the north and the south, or as above and so below, or inside or outside of the perspective. And within the two pillars is one portal into truth, because on either side of the portal is not truth. However, that divide falsehoods from the realm of truth. Between them is a center stage that is lit by the architect between the sun and the moon. Above the pillars are two spheres representative of the north and the south, or the interior and the exterior, the earth and the space, as inner space and outer space. However, above the pillars, they are able to see not only within, inside of the realm of the god stage, they are able to see above and out into the realm of falsehoods. It is only when they are able to see what each other are able to see that they are able to see the true light of the architect. And this is the portal, the one portal that is the truth, and according to what is truth. Truth is what can be seen by two parties. And the symbol is very old. We see that it's been used for um, sports. This is a, an Italian company, Fila, and the Etruscan alphabet is mirror backwards. So we have um, Aleph is the name of the Hebrew symbol that represents the two pillars. And we'll have a series a bit more on Hebrew geometry, but it also represents the Byzantine bird because it's the two seers, the two whole seers. And we get the um, word Holy See from the Vatican's name, um, from being able to see, from being um, uh, able to see outside the kingdom. So being able to see inside the grid is the aim of the architect and of a shared lens between the inner space and the outer space. And a view outside the pillars is um, a special lucky thing for some, but it's also a curse for others if they want to know what they think of as an absolute truth that is true for both the inner and outer space realm. So the Holy See was um, responsible for taking a lot of this information. Uh, in fact, the Freemasons uh, don't happen for hundreds of years until after the Catholic Church has banished the Jesuits and the Jesuits have to start their own organization. So the Byzantine symbols became Catholic. And we know that the Catholic Church did not invent this symbolism, um, but for some reason we seem to attribute them to the Freemasons in the Enlightenment era. But we also know they studied Rosicrucian texts of Hermes and that these are much older concepts. So it truly was a holy rowing empire that brought themselves to the information and then took the information elsewhere. They were conquest doers that took people, places, and things and shuffled them up. And you could not ever question this or else you could end up in a lot of trouble. We landed on Plymouth Rock, and not that Plymouth Rock landed on us, as Malcolm X said. But who are we to argue with the finders of the New World and their manifest destiny? Because we would most likely be committed, or worse, considered witches, and that has a worse route to take. But in the 19th century, it wasn't just that they put you at the stake, they put people in lunatic asylums. And lunatic, of course, means a lunar addict, um, someone addicted to the moon. And we now know that the symbol for the sun and the moon next to the giant symbol are the sun and the moon. The giant symbol is Saturn. And so these were Saturn addicts that uh, were told to never mention Tartaria again if they ever did um, refer to it, of course, as the old country and that it was bad a lot of the time. Also, and the old country. Call it the old country. Everywhere was the old country. So, and that milieu of global conflict, doesn't matter where you're from, that you experienced. Um, you know, whether it be 260 days worth of 
asteroidal impacts and earthquakes and comets and devastations that lit up the sky and tore apart epic stone cities across the world, including Caracas and in Chile and in Colombia and in um, France and in Russia, where there were, by the way, earthquake in Spanish called Terremoto. Also, Krakatoa's Java events, you know, and the annihilation of Moscow, where a stone city was burned to brimstone. And they'll tell you about the wood structures in Russia, and there, there were wood structures, but that's not a wood bridge. Um, we're just part of some sort of Napoleonic invasion, and that Napoleon was just the super complex guy. And that war with Eurasia, we've always been at war with East Asia, or, I mean, who amongst us can remember what it was like before and what the narration was before the 1790s and 1830s, because it's all been erased. And this gets us into this concept of Paris syndrome, which I thought sounded crazy until I actually went to Paris. And it only works on certain kinds of people. Apparently, it's very common on Japanese and on students. And what happens is when you've studied Paris and you actually know about Paris, Paris does not make any sense. It's not the actual Paris is not like the studies of Paris. They, the place does not add up to interpretation. And of course, you're supposed to throw away your studies, right? And then believe what you see. I hope. Well, so Plymouth Rock landed on us, and it's a great story, really. Um, the way it's told um, by people that are knowingly supposed to be liars. Anyway, that they escaped from the Dark Ages. And imagine for a second that you're in the Dark Ages. You know, it's whether it's real or not, just close your eyes. You're in the dark, and it's dirty, and there's no lights when you open them. Everything's covered in mud, there's no plumbing, and so you go and you find a book club. And the book clubs uh, are cool. They're men's associations, fraternal lodges that are well lit at night, they're clean, and they have meetups, they have maker spaces, they have a fab lab, tech shops, lodges that are full of information from all over the world, and they're collecting more information all the time, and some of these guys are even making their own works about these works to explain the works that are too old to be understood, and from them are steam machines coming out, and interesting contraptions. Brilliantly, they rediscovered the secrets of the pyramids. Except, where are all those new pyramids? Except for the Louvre and, you know, the, the glass hollow pyramids, and, you know, they're, they're not the same thing. So. <laughs> like, there was an era of, of, of Rosicrucianism in the 1650s that we're told happened, where the Cathars took this information that they had been saving from ancient Egypt and Samaria and Hermes, and they learned so much about how it mattered that they forgot the dreams inside their own heads, and they started emulating and making statues and architecture to the gods, temples to the gods of other people, which Andrea Palladio, uh, he, was, he either stole it and described it, and I think he's a great example of one of these lodge dissertationists, and it, it seems like pretty obvious that's the official story anyway. He isn't supposedly a creator of this architecture. He's simply a chronicler. The Andrea Palladio was a student of the works of Vitruvius, or Vitruvia, um, whom is also the origin of the Vitruvian Man, or Vitruvian Man of Leonardo da Vinci who was a proponent of his works as well. Now, as you've heard me say, um, Truvia, by Truvia, think of this piece of Trubian trivia, which there is a Spanish city called Trubia that is a Spanish Gothic city in the Spanish state of Asteria, or Bisteria. And it was a 19th century colonial industrial factory um, town known for their Trubia tanks, the homemade tanks, supposedly, of the Spanish Civil War. And these tanks were phenomenal pieces of machinery that led to, after the capture um, by nationalist troops, the creation of the Panzer tank, which 
um, was one of many weapons that came out of the Trubian factories. Trubia has the architecture, it has the technology, it's Vitruvia. So, Vice Rubia, or the Western Byzantine Empire, the Western Roman Empire, um, Vice Tartaria. That gets us into the Spanish Habsburg Empire. And Espana, I thought as a child, meant the bread, right? Espan, but it doesn't. And there's some sort of Iberian etymology to refer to a stone or bronze and metalworking um, advanced civilization, which is an interesting. And I think we're going to pick it up from here next time. Um, thanks a lot. So we'll be talking about empirical imperialism in the Tartary series. We're going to talk a bit about America and the name and Giovanni Cabato or John Cabot, or as he was known in Venice in his lifetime to his friends, Zwan Cabato. And Zwan is, I guess, the John of Venice. And yes, this is his face. Um... Earlier, I posted the Patahotep group. I've chosen the J letter of Cyrillic for Hotep, so um, it would be easier to find for Cyrillic alphabet seekers. But also, I found it interesting that his name was Juan, and um, Szechuan comes from um, this. So, also, this is Juan's house. Um, you can see evidence of you know an understory and this is the other option for the name of america amerigo vespucci or vice pucci um whom is also a, a spaniard italian um a castile so then last time we were talking about how after krakatoa an entire civilization was wiped out hundreds of thousands of people dead everything dead in sight except not because there was Roger Verbeek. Roger Verbeek is a pretty, um, there's not a lot of information about him. He's born on April 7th, you know, he's from the Netherlands. He worked for the Dutch East India Trading Company in Indonesia, but he's the guy who somehow went on a rowboat to Krakatoa, only for a few minutes, of course, but he saw it and then he left. And then there's, of course, the book by Alan Bailey about the Krakatoa Lighthouse, because, you know, there was a lighthouse, and it's still there, the Fourth Estate Lighthouse, and someone supposedly survived in the lighthouse. There's a video, like a, a National Geographic, I think, made about Krakatoa, and um, it's essentially this concept that this man and this guy in his lighthouse survived underwater, you know, and then they were immediately famous and made lots of money. But, like, like more money than anybody ever. Lots of money. Like, crazy amounts of money. And, yeah, this lighthouse, the Fourth Point Lighthouse, it was submerged underwater. And it's right, you know, there under... I mean, this is just... Yeah, it's insane. Because he was there for 30 days. Like, okay. But, yeah, here's the lighthouse. A super cool lighthouse, don't get me wrong. So... These are the traders of the Lost Archives, the Universal Trading Company, right? Universal Trading Company, the Dutch East Indies and West Indies Trading Company. The Occidental Universal? I don't know. Here's a recap of Trubia I wanted to mention last time we talked about Andrea Palladio and whether or not he actually studied Vitruvius and the Vitruvian Man from Leonardo da Vinci and, like, you know, we think about how that could be, like, Leonardo da Vinci talks a lot about, like, femininity and androgyny. And, well, maybe Trubia, Trubia, like, the, the electrical systems that Asteria had that ended up in the war that became panzer tanks and were originally homemade tanks of the Civil War and the electric systems that they had invented probably came from um, Tartaria. Well, let's get into steam power because the electric steamers of the 19th century are fantastic and they don't really require coal they just require steam and so I propose that they were electric now there are lots of examples of steam powered electric things nuclear generators are steam powered and um, nuclear itself is a steampunk technology 
uh, and they want you to con- convince you that it's dangerous, of course, like oil companies and whatever. Like, or, I mean, anybody. Like, they, be, it's really a safe, simple thing that you can produce a amount of heat that then produces pressure, and the water pressure then feeds off of this regulated cold water to hot water, and then spins turbines, which produce electricity and generate energy. So we have examples of this that are abound. Here's a Swiss electric steam train. Here's a General Electric steam train. God, that's a beautiful steam train. And here's, you know, an exploded boiler. And you start seeing like what happens when they don't know how to run an electric steam train. Like they start putting coal on it because it's intuitive that you can heat up steam and electricity to heat up water to make steam it's 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 a natural progression steam power and electric power uh, here's the lms princess royal electric steam engine but it's it's also just so beautiful right like uh, i believe lms stands for like london midland scotland um rail system i think that's what it is so this is a british uh rail so all these trains were used to um, get gold and silver and salt from places. Here's the salt flats in Bolivia and Uni where there is a graveyard of these steam powered trains. And I've been there and there's just, there's just miles of them and you can climb all over them. No one's going to stop you. There's nothing, um, else out there really besides harmonic frequency patterns of these hexagonal salt crystals that you can just for miles. But these trains, right? Like just look at these beautiful, cast iron machines that are just abandoned here and compare them to the Trubian electric rail systems. So that gets us back into the west of the Red Roaming Empire and the Spanish Castile Habsburg Empire, the Spanish Germanics, Hispanic Germanics. And um, we talked about how Espana does not mean the bread. <laughs> it means something in Iberian to the effect of the metal civilization, which makes sense. And Habsburg family, the Bohemian family of uh, Elizabeth Valois, you know, who was, uh, she was Parisian or French, and then her son was Bohemian. Well, France had very little power during this time because of, I mean, apparently they probably did. Let's think about Charlemagne slightly differently before he converted to the Roman Empire's Catholicism. I assume France was very powerful. However, it was maybe less global at this time. The Roman Empire also limited in a sense, but you can see where it was strengthened. Um, but the, the black nobility of Eastern Europe, you know, is, is separate. And so you can see how, um, how the Spanish Habsburg Empire was just huge. Italy nor- is split. North Italy is Germain. South Italy is Spanish Germain. So Germain, Spain also is not one place. It's like the United States at, at best. It's more It's more like Switzerland. You've got people that speak different languages everywhere, though. In the northwest, you've got Galatians. In the uh, northeast or the uh, center, I guess you could say, you have um, the Basque state, which is in Spain and in France and um, ought to be its own state, really. You know, it is essentially and it should be. Uh, then there's the... Uh, Valencia, which, you know, just look how close it is to the Byzantine Empire. And there's just a lot of um, trade going on at this point with the Moors in the southeast. And um, there's a route called the Camino de Santiago. Um, an important book to consider is A Song of Ronin, which really compares the Arabs and the um, Europeans on levels where the poor are with the poor on either side and the richer with the rich on either side, the Templars and the Ottomans are the same. Here's the DNA uh, of Germanic Italians, and notice the vibrancy of high um, concentration in the north. Also, the spot, you know, where something happened, uh, and has the RZ RZ36 phenotype is um, is limited um, in the south, which is another interesting aspect. So it shows that there is a there is a very specifically Germain um, Italy. And here is the um, South Germain city. You know, these are these are these are Italian Alps, Alpine um, cities. So Italy had at one point been actually where that red begins. Um, and after World War II, 
when Germany was forced to return lands, everyone had to show the maps. It, it, Italy had made false maps that showed they were a much grander sized state than they had been. And even though the people up there still speak German, they're Italians now. So here's some Tartarian architecture. And here's the dominion of the Habsburg family um, spread out across uh, Transylvania. Um, at a certain point, the United Empire is just so expansive that it covers um, all of Spain, but also all of northern Germanic regions such as the Netherlands. The Huguenots are included in this, um, and the Dutch, which, uh, which leads to the Eighty-Year War and the Dutch East Indies Trading Company. And, of course, Ferdinand and Isabella, like we, you know, this is an interesting, beautiful... Ferdinand and Isabella from the Netherlands are not Ferdinand and Isabella from Spain, or are they? I mean, supposedly they're not, um, but something interesting to look into slightly more. I mean, I'm not suggesting they are yet, but that is an interesting correlation in that they were run out of town for their control of the Netherlands. Also, the Netherlands was considered the land over there that was run by itself and it rather bothered the Spanish Empire. And here was Alexander, the Duke, and he ran the Netherlands. Also notice that Ferdinand is drawn to be kind of a schmuck. I'm not sure a better word. He just doesn't look super um, is there assertive. And his wife ends up giving the kingdom um, keys to her handsome Croatian friend, um, Christopher Colon, uh, Columbus. Also, here's the Habsburg um, crest, and I think we've gone over this. It's you know the dragon with the peacock figures. And from 1568 to 1648 in Holland was the war of the Eighty Year War, which led to the secession of Holland from Spain. And also in this time was the looting of the churches of Lyon and a great period of iconoclasm. When the churches were looted, the symbols were taken down. This could be an interesting time to look for devastation of Tartaria because of the iconoclasm. I mean, we see the building storm of 16th century, the building storm, where people just went around tearing things apart and looting um, statues and if you go to some of these churches that haven't been looted in certain places, you'll find horned statues of gods that are Athenian in Catholic churches still. So it's clear that these churches were not um, were not always um, well. I don't know if it's clear that they were not always religiously Christian, um, but it's interesting that they they presuppose that they were built at a time when they did not understand the Bible, and therefore they had all sorts of symbols for non-biblical and perhaps pagan. Um, also, Spanish pillaging of gold and the stamping and minting of coinage led to the inflation of gold and its value being worth less than silver. People had enough gold, and they said, all right, I, yeah, I got enough gold. Can how, Do you have any silver? I mean, that literally went down at some point, which um, shows how much gold there was and also how much how, few, how little gold there was before that. Um also interesting is the the father of Francois again. So here are some personal seals, um, and they eventually become representative of the kingdom's wealth itself. And you know, notice the Arabic writing on the backside of the East India coinage and the 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 the, the fractional rupee of copper coins. Eventually, paper money uh, replaces these coinages, but not until the Dutch East India Company. And it's interesting that Marco Polo talks about paper money before this, but these written receipts really start again with corporatism. And we're supposed to believe that all of this information that the porters had grabbed from the Library of Alexandria, such as the Camera Obscura, um, and anything else from you know the Hellenistic wisdoms of engineers, such as um, the uh, Hero steam engine, was just repurposed in Arabia, you know, in like a we're going to start a series episode on the Latter-day Saints. I want to quickly read 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 through 22. Test everything, hold fast to what is good, and abstain from, evil, from every form of evil. 
there's better translations, but it's essentially like, test all things and hold fast to what is good and abstain from everything that is bad. Because this is the Kali Yuga and all. And with that, I say try a little bit of LDS and figure out what you feel about it. Because it's pretty interesting religion. <sighs> so with that, a little backstory on Joseph Smith. He was born in 1805. He was charismatic. He was an esotericist with the Jupiter talisman in his pocket when he died. He was a dowser, like his father, who was a well witcher, which is what another word for dowsing is. And if you don't know much about dowsing, uh, it's a way of finding wells um, by finding water underneath the earth. And it works. I mean, I have seen it work. My grandfather was a well dowser successfully, amongst other things, you know, like working for, he was an engineer also. So perhaps you have to believe. Anyway, he was a good boy this Joseph Smith, and he was trying to find out from God directly how to be the best and which way was the right way. And God said to start his own fellowship, so he did. Eventually, it led to a religion with the plural marriage system, which led to um, a lot of controversy about the church itself. I don't really see this as a big controversy. I'm surprised it is, considering, you know, And essentially, he had an alpha wife, and he had um, a system. And after the Mormon Wars, there was a lot of widows, So, because there had been a genocide uh, campaign, an extermination, at least, of the Latter-day Saints from Missouri. And a, a brutal war that just killed so many people, women and children even. You know, I've heard quotes that the boys and girls, 5 to 10 years old, begged not to be shot, and they were told that um, lice breeds rats, something to that effect. So Brigham Young, after Joseph Smith, led um, with the uh, Missouri Wars behind him um, and created with Joseph Smith after the fall of Joseph Smith this epic religion. And it makes a lot of sense also progenitors would, like Charles Dawkins, who, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day sometimes, unless it's spinning randomly, in which case it could be wrong all the time. The point is Richard Dawkins he did say that there is a selfish gene, and it's the idea that genes would like to exterminate all the other genes. And essentially, his religion talked about this prophet from this ancient culture that spanned the world. And the Mormons were trying to create this heaven where they were actually more than just on death to you part, you become your own existence. And it's a, it's a fascinating concept because it gets into this idea of Mormon transhumanism and becoming more than just a person but becoming an entire type of civilization with uh, beings underneath you so latter-day futurism is an interesting subject and there's actually a field of it if you're interested in latter-day saint transhumanism mormon transhumanism yeah i'll skip that part but really it's about creating this heaven on earth because you th imagine that you've created a society where everything is perfect and you try to convert them. You say, oh, well, when you die, you'll go to heaven and be with God. And they say, well, we already live forever and we don't understand what's the difference between heaven and a place where we have no sickness or hunger and everything's happy all the time. And who is this God and how is it more powerful and more knowledgeable and wise than we are? You know, and this is this, uh, this next level civilization. Um, Religion that's slightly more interesting than the way it's been presented, and I think you know that deserves a little bit of credit. So, also, he got what he wanted, and it turned into this crazy thing. Um, and it wasn't so great to have ninety-nine wives because a lot of them turned out um, to be of other men, or the men were just in general angry and jealous uh, for not having them themselves. So they martyred or murdered Joseph Smith in. Um, a fashion that made him more famous and uh, made it impossible for him to do anything um, bad ever again. So it only allowed you a legacy of positivity for the most part and then hearsay. So this is an interesting time to find out that Joseph Smith is not, you know, they're telling you often he's a drunk, angry, fat, ugly man. So here's his death mask, right? And you get an idea that they didn't really lie about his pictures. He was, you know, a rather handsome, you know, man. Interesting also, right? So 15 years earlier, when before he died, he had been reading out of a hat. And I think you've probably seen the South Park, but there's more to it than that. 
it's an interesting story about this Indo area American empire that was literate and had metals. And it's interesting that so much of it seems to have been disappeared, but we think it could be have just stolen, you know, like it belongs in a museum, Indiana Jones would say. But he also talked about different races in the Americas um, that had been genocided, raped into extinction, or, you know, the Lamanites, the Jaredites, the Molochites, and the Nephites. It's a very interesting correlation with Alexandrian Coptic stories about Tartaria and the mobile cities are mentioned in the Jaredites or the Molochites. They have the flags. This is from a Mormon book about the Jaredites too. It's like Genghis Khan's, you know, hordes in Europe. Mormon scholars have gone deep into this. And we talked last time a bit about mega floods and wars and the idea of these storm wars that existed in the 19th century or before that are photographed and documented as floods and droughts and dust storms throughout the 19th century, including this picture of Sacramento that, as far as the eye can see, is both water and cities, which is an interesting um, aside, plus the electric systems. And you find that these mega storms were not freak events, but repeated about every 200 years. Although, coincidentally, you, I tend to think that those are the same events, and we'll get into them more about why later. But the sedimentation um, that has resulted was you know, documented in geologists in California. You can find, we'll tell you, about the uh, mega floods and the mud floods. So here's a picture of simultaneously the drought happening to the flood. And um, within, within the same year or two, you see a difference in... Um, the, the clearing out. And also there was a Mormon island in the 1830s that's been buried under a lake in California because of a dam. And it's, um, it was very, very vibrant. There was a bridge. There is, uh, there's, it's been uncovered recently, more or less. And you can see the quality of the stone masonry is um, almost Peruvian, again, and Gothic, Visigothic, and, you know, alludes to this Tartarian concept. And here's another example of a submerged ghost city. It's... And here's another example of a submerged ghost city. Um, and you'll find these around South America here in the world. But here's one in Venezuela in Potosi, where they built a dam in order to essentially hide this church. Um, they had electricity, of course. South America gets most of its electricity from the Paraguayan Damn, but iconoclasm, um, communist era, right? So we've got the building kind of wiped out. And interestingly enough, it survived. And um, when it resurfaced, it was, it was still the last thing that lasted. So they tried to blow it up. Seriously. They tried to blow it up with dynamite. This is what's left of it. That should trigger to provoke you as well. And there's lots of other churches that are, um, you can look up ghost water churches, underwater churches, submerged cathedrals, and you'll see that they're everywhere. Canada has full cities. This is like um, in Europe, I think this is in Venice, I forget. Near near Venice is an island called Provigilia, and it was, um, you know, clearly a star fort, and uh, it has arches and architecture, but it was used for the plague and to house um and then an insane asylum. So I, I believe it was a biochemical warfare uh, laboratory at some point, or or perhaps it was you know a medical institution for studying, and things went out of control. But it became a very creepy place for you know for the next you know few centuries. And again, look at the the architecture, the arches, and the the proportions of the ones above and below. So for for the golden ratio, another island that you should look for. Because where in the world is Isla Bermea? It's um, supposed to be in the Gulf of Mexico. I've heard theories that people say it was made up as a tourist attraction, but I think that that's pretty absurd. It's more likely that the official story from British maps and from Humboldt sailors showed that it disappeared underwater. Um, either it sank or the water levels rose, and there's a lot of evidence for water levels and land levels rising. So here's a picture of these dust storms um, that I think we now know were bigger and longer and not 
just when I mean, we were explained about this dust bowl that happened and people driving with these fancy vehicles that cost $500 across the country to just populate this new world. And you got to wonder about that. Like the Ford vehicles were insanely cheap and then they just poured out into the streets with them. So who amongst us can remember what really happened? It's back to, you know, we constantly are asking about how all truth is, is lies because everyone's lying to some extent. I mean, people will tell you they've seen this stuff and who are you going to believe, you know, because basically your options come down to tall tales and that's about it. And tall tales are interesting in and of itself. If you start looking into the American tall tales, a lot of them come from the 18th, 19th century. Um, you have stories like Pecos Bill, who sends his wife to the moon and he rides a, a dust devil or a vortice, you know, a vortex, um, a, a tornado through the, the, the plains. And David Crockett, who was born on a mountaintop in Tennessee, predominantly of French Huguenot ancestry. And that gets into the Irish Porter connection because of the porters from Ireland who came bringing the French Huguenots after allied with the British in the war. But Davy Crockett, for all of his eccentric stories, was a real man. David Crockett was a senator. He was considered um, an amazing hero until he became renowned for his stories. And then he called him a drunk. And they said he would was just making up all these fantastic stories and that there's no way these stories happened during the 19th century, such as there's one, he went to the North Pole because there was a mini ice age and he restarted the earth, which had slowed down its spinning from the inside. And he starts the earth spinning again and heats up and the earth begins um, to rotate again. Um, so you have tall tales, or then you have these sobered surveyors whom you have to trust slightly more, I suppose, than our drunkards. But who are these surveyors? They're the latter-day saints who don't drink, of course, and they're, you know, very hard workers. And they were a godsend, let's say, during the Spanish-American War and in the Civil War. And the U.S. Mormon Battalion March is an infamous long route that was taken um, as the Mormons went across all of these regions that cover essentially what modern-day mud-flooded uh, areas are, where you can see California's sand, um, long desert cover. Why would you walk through that desert? Um, and up through the rings, you know, into the lakes, um, into Mount Zion and around Utah, finding the, the center of America. And this is the Mormon capital a uh, battalion monument in Salt Lake City. Uh, and you can see these Sumerian-like stoneworks in front of this Athenian neoclassical Palladio-inspired building that is of Tartarian ancestry. And here's a tunnel under the Mormon churches. There was a, 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 a sort of golden dragon hidden in here. So there are tunnels underneath the Mormon temples that lead to places, of course, and also, the Mormon genealogy archives are built into tunnels into the sides of mountains. They are military-like fortifications, is the best way to put that. And the Mormon genealogy archives are very important because they baptize in the name of all those who have fallen without the opportunity of knowing the religion and baptizing themselves. So they keep very dense records, and in fact run Ancestry.com. And this is where they keep their archives, in these military-like bunkers embedded into the sides of stone mountains. So it's, a, it's sort of a fantastic story about this group of people that were supposedly um, the sobered witnesses and their belief in something that's so much of a tall tale. But um, is it really? Because there's plenty of evidence of the pale Native American tribes and the idea is less and less disturbing of Indo-Aryan relations with Scythians in the so South America and North America. So is it possible that in 1823 when Joseph Smith discovered these golden plates that they were real? And Joseph Smith preached to the Indians and many Indians became Latter-day Saints as well, which was very interesting. And that gets into the Cherokee Confederate Alliance. Because he shows the five civilized tribes in a sort of negative light at the end of the Book of Mormon. So the Confederate Alliance um, and the Cherokee, by the way, 
who's very fantastic and supposedly is written by a man named Sequoia, though he even claimed to have gotten it from natives, um, were part of the principal five tribes, and not principled, by the way, but the, um, the leader, the leading five tribes. And they were the civilized. And, and civilized is an interesting term because these, these Indians were slave traders themselves and kept slaves. And it is notable that there are descendants of these slaves, not only of the Cherokee, who had thousands, also of the uh, other civilized tribes, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Seminoles, and the Creeks, all large slave trade economies. And were the principal slave traders with the, um, which which gets into what the Book of Mormon said about the final winners of the South American wars. So Temescua started the indigenous confederacy, um, or at least created one, which these could have been Soviets that could reform at any time, like lodges. Temescua was known for his iconoclasm of Western symbolism. Temescua's confederacy was an attempt to escape the imperialism of the colonial empire of corporate British and Dutch East Indy traders who had successfully subjugated, replicate their control over North America that they had. And, you know, we're told that the Athenians were our original democratic link, but that's not actually where we get, they were socialist pedophiles, that's not actually where we get democracy and self-determination, which is a more important thing than a dictatorship of the majority oppressing a minority. Um, but we got the confederacy, the, the American system of confederacy came from, and the American system of federal tribalism came from the confederacy of the Indians. The sacking of Tartary as the United Trade Company's um, colonial takeover of North America and of South America and of East Asia. So the causes of the War of 1812. Temescu's Confederacy was convinced by the British that it was a wise move to rebel against the United States. And immediately, Temescu and his brother intended to launch a triple threat with the three tribes against the British and the French. Um, Temescu created a confederacy against all white settlers, and the British helped to attack these white settlers. So that's an interesting point. And we're told that it's because the British and the French and the Americans all hated each other, so they thought they could use the Indians as cannon fodder. Might be true. There's an example of this in, other, in another state. In Paraguay, which the Jesuits had built this fantastic republic, and there's a film called The Mission. It's worth seeing. Um, they essentially took the same strategy as the French-American War and decimated the population from all angles, from Brazil, from Argentina, and Bolivia, and killed 90 to 99% of the population. Very few um, women and children survived. And it makes sense why they want to dismantle all of these monuments that are in the name of the fallen Confederates because these are symbols of family and love and people holding each other together. They're not the symbols of hate that we are taught that they are and or we are reacting to, whereas we're reacting for. And I wondered when this started, how this could go down, that Southern hospitality would become the next hate crime because, you know, there was also a religion of peace now. There's no such thing as a civil war. I'm gonna call it something else. The uncivil war of federalist crimes against humanity. And it's normally called the war of northern aggression, but I don't think that's quite aggressive enough. So, the uncivil war of federalist crimes against humanity during the war of northern aggression. And this is the original flag of the Confederacy. Underneath is the battle flag that we're so familiar with. But in fact, the Confederate flag was very similar to the original. And if you're familiar with the Uncivil War of Northern Aggression, it's quite a nightmare. It's essentially the first major war that were demonstrated industrialization of automatic weapons, major explosives like dynamite, 
more in another video specifically on technology in the bright age all sorts of crazy weapons eli whitney and standardization leads to mass manufacturing which makes it possible to produce large amounts of these weapons quickly for some reason all of these machines that can dig out california gold were digging these trenches by hand these are the elite forces digging out these trenches probably more likely an archaeological dig they can find something and whether or not Archimedes had models of these weapons or they existed in ancient times, this is the first time in recent memory that media has made news about them for us to see. For instance, the Gatling gun. But I really want to talk a bit about Confederate submarines. They are a fantastic and interesting thing. And there were Yankee submarines as well, at least the Alligator. But after the war, some of the Confederate technology becomes declassified and available to the public, such as H.L. Hunley's submarine. It's a fantastic design. It has a propeller that is spun through the center. Men will spin it sort of like an egg beater or a bicycle. This is the Pioneer in St. John's Bayou. I saw this one. It got stuck on some seaweed or kelp, the propeller unable to pull out of the underwater, and it was unable to detangle. That's at least the story. And that gets into the tunnels and the literal underground railroads, because there were. And I've always heard that, wondering about the underground railroads. And when I was a kid, I asked, you know, was it a real railroad? Some adults will say no. The other ones knew, yes, there were underground railroads and certainly tunnel systems. And they were used to connect to mansions, which then would take them to other locations. In many circumstances, there was a map that connected underground tunnels. Doctors are sawing legs off in shock without any sort of essentially just robbing women and children of their sons and fathers, taking them down from the potato famine. Drafting is it's conscripting men, and they're killing them 20 to 1 often. Grant says, send me more troops, drunkenly, because they get killed a lot. It's okay because every 20 men, they get 20 more men, but there's only so many Southerners. And notice these tunnels. And they didn't just fight around their houses, you know, they fought in their houses often. Like This was not fought far flung from where their homes were. They were defending their homes for some perspective. Watch Gangs of New York again for some perspective on how the North actually felt, the way they treated Irish and African Americans, not the South, which was a rather glamorous um, culture, especially in French areas like Louisiana. So we're told about General Sherman who marched across, um, destroying the towns, if you ever see a hand put in a jacket like that, it means they're keeping a secret. We were told that the potato famine was a natural blight. It could have been just a reason of monocropping, and that's a lovely story, but it actually was a uh, deliberate event in order to kill off as many Irish as possible. The food was evacuated from the country. The people were starved and killed, and they were kept from eating seaweed, even. This is something that has happened before and will happen again. One of the examples, of course, is the Holodomor of the Ukraine, which is a tragedy not even describable, but let me try. They took a bunch of kids, they shot them if they picked grain off the ground, they starved them to death while they made them work, and then they took all the wheat and food and sold it. And this is how they emptied the Ukraine. And we'll get into why the Ukraine is so important to this Georgian man, Stalin. So it was a time of starvation and emigration, where men and women and children were sent in mass exodus from their homes across the world. And there are trains that actually took boys and girls to all over the country, the lost boy generation of the 18th and 17th and the 19th century. And if you've ever heard of being Shanghai, where you wake up on a boat on the way to Shanghai, well, a lot of these boys became soldiers. And it didn't always work out well. Here's an example of blast wounds. So these are the kids, by the way, that were... And you know, I bet this guy didn't have a slave. He was one, though. He was an indentured servant. They want you to forget, and the only way to do that is to tear down any physical remnants and any iconography. And to obscure the intention... And the alternative narrative, of course, is that once the Confederacy were a free people, it was the second war of independence, and there were a lot of African Americans that fought on the side of the Confederacy and kept their pride into their elderly years. Um, um, my father's generation were probably the last kids to get to meet 
Confederate and Yankee soldiers that were still around after the war. But they have a very specific narrative that doesn't really fit with what we're told. Um, essentially, the more you look into it, it makes a lot more sense why there were so many Confederate African Americans. They saw the slavery emancipation proclamation, which only liberate Confederate slaves who had rebelled. The North slaves would still be in slavery. Imagine finding out, and by us being an American slave who could read, which there were, and finding out that they were not freed because they were able to understand the fine print. And then began the period of deconstruction. 15 years of complete control where there were soldiers guarded on all corners. And simultaneous wars goes on and on around the world. Particularly Franco wars are interesting to look at, such as the Franco-Swedish and the Second French Intervention in Mexico, which happens simultaneously to the war in the United States and the Yankees during their martial law occupation of the South. Notice also the Franco uniforms are very similar to the Yankee uniforms. And it can be said that the war may have existed because of the inability to enforce the Monroe Doctrine internationally abroad of the United States. And these are the kids who fought for the Confederacy, just for some more perspective. And you could say that they were just forced to fight, but I'll tell you a little bit about this guy who he died in his backyard defending his sisters um, in his, the house, and his last words were, home, 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 as he died in the field. It wasn't that he you know, wanted to fight so much, but that he kind of had to. But he got left holding the bag, like an entire new nation got left holding the bag. And it's interesting, it's not remembered so much for the ending of slavery, that instead it's you know remembered for the history that came before it. And it's the history that we're trying to discover that we're being kept from. This gets into the idea that once we were free, because when the 13th Amendment mentioned slavery for the first time in the Constitution, it actually defined its use, where it says, slavery or involuntary servitude shall exist as a punishment for crime where the party shall have been duly convicted within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Literally legalized slavery. So, there's that. Oh yeah, and why is it called slavery again? It comes from Slavic people, from when they were objectified so often it became a verb by the Moorish slavers, slavers. Twelve years a Slav. And the tie comes from Croatia, it's the Krovat, a Slavic invention. This is how we do, or how we did, because this is more how we're seen these days, apparently. But I get back to the Paraguay Triple Alliance War, which genocided 90% of the population. But it's very similar that in 1865, and all this is happening simultaneously, remember. Paraguay is having the Triple Alliance War at the exact same time as the Uncivil War of Northern Aggression and wiping out 90% of the population. So, um, and they are literate people then, but that's all to the more to the point about Tartaria. So these are some of the remnants of their people. And in the north of Paraguay, in the west, is a place called Philadelphia, where every sign is in German. I've actually been there. There's literally a street called South Hindenburg Avenue. It's just fantastic and interesting that there's not much more than dirt roads everywhere but these beautiful brick buildings so it's some of the most fantastic deep basement buildings you're going to find in paraguay and perhaps the world interesting architecture abound you can and you do want